Hi, my name is Dumi Pake and I'm an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here. And with young men and women taking the lead, some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Tumi Pake is an experienced chief executive officer with a demonstrated history of working in the health, wellness, and fitness industry skilled in operations management, banking, sales, entrepreneurship, and capital raising. This business development professional graduated from University of South Africa and Virginia Commonwealth University. After spending seven years working in the banking industry, Tumi founded his group, which has 80 full-time employees across its branches, plus 50 contractors who provide specialized group training. He started his group in 2014 without any experience in the fitness sector and opted to partner with Awaitu Projects, an SMME investment company that provided the 5 million rands needed to set up the business and help mitigate risk. Tumi is the founder and CEO at Zenzele Fitness Group. All right, welcome to Under 40 CEOs to me. Thank you very much, and a pleasure to meet you. All right, amazing. You attended the University of South Africa, yes. um, where you graduated with a degree in uh, a bachelor's degree, uh, I must say, in accounting and finance. So share, um, share with me about your preteen years and what led you to study uh, accounting and uh, finance. <laughs> so, you know, I've always been an avid sports person. I've always loved sports, um, but I think that when I, I guess growing up as a kid, you know, one of the things I stumbled upon is when I finished high school, mm. I started working in a bookstore. Oh. And, um, and I think, I used to hate reading, but I got fascinated by reading books. And then that's when I started being interested in finance, accounting, and business. Uh, because I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do with my career. And when I started reading books on, you know, business, and then I thought, you know what, Maybe uh, signing up for uh, uh, a degree in, in, in accounting and finance is what I want to do. Um, and that led me to get into the banking space, yes. becoming a, a banker, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, but the entrepreneurial bug was always there. And I think I've always, I would always end up being an entrepreneur eventually. Yeah. All right. So talking about banking, you spent about seven years yeah, in banking. Please do share about your time in banking. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, I think it was a great experience. Um, so I used to be in, uh, I was a structured lending specialist, mm -hmm. uh, structured financing. Um, and I think that, you know, when I look back now, being an entrepreneur, I feel like it was preparing me to, to, to be where I am because, uh, you know, capital raising, uh, structuring deals for businesses is what I used to do. Mm -hmm. And eventually as an entrepreneur, I had to try and, you know, raise funds and, and, and capital for myself. So the experience was, was fantastic. Um, but I, I think that the, the governance that it teaches you in terms of running a you know, professionally run business is, is what I, I implement in my business, you know, to have great governance, uh, processes, structures, uh, and, and make sure that you, you, know, you, you run a well sound business, a scalable uh, business, and, and that's what I, I did, yeah. All right, so you've been an ambassador at the Young African Leadership Initiative since yes. 2016. Yes. I believe this initiative was founded by President uh, Obama. That's so correct. what's your role as an ambassador? So my role as ambassador is, you know, it, it's so funny that um, initially when, when, you, um, when you become an entrepreneur or, or you, you're trying to grow this high growth business, uh, everything is about yourself, what you can achieve financially. But I think that being involved in that initiative it allowed me to see the bigger picture that you know there is a mandate as a young African to tell the story, to inspire people, to collaborate, and 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 you know Africa can only scale grow by its own Africans. And I think being an ambassador is is that's what it taught me. You know, I was in the U.S. Uh, for for two months where we actually were part of the program, mm -hmm. um, studying business and entrepreneurship and leadership. Uh, we met President Obama, and one of the things that we learned is that you know, being a servant, servant leadership and really doing something to, to give back to, you, to your continent, uh, to, 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 to young people and inspire people to be able to do the same. And I think that's the only way Africa could take itself out of, 
out of whatever situation it's in. And, and, and I think that's something I plan to do for the rest of my life. All right. Still talking collaboration. Uh, you have a bunch of side gigs. Uh, business mentor at <laughs> Alan Gray Orbis Foundation. Yeah. Um, associate at Harambe Entrepreneur Alliance. Yeah. Uh, please do tell me about these organizations and your role um, within them. Yeah, so for the Ellen Gray, uh, um, as a business mentor, I think it's also um, the reason for that was to, to also be involved in, in uh, so I'm a, I'm a mentor. Um, and, and what happens is a lot of university graduates, postgraduates, uh, people who are smart, educated, um, part of what we're trying to do is also to help them to have an entrepreneurial mindset, to say the skill set that they have. How can they take that skill set and create something that is sustainable, create employment? You know, speaking for the South African context, uh, unemployment is at its all-time high, we, we, at least 40% uh, unemployment rate. And so we need those young, smart people to create employment, to, to create innovative businesses that could employ more people. And, and that is the agenda that, that we're trying to push. And so me playing a role in a guy, you know, one of the guys I'm mentoring, he, he's, an, he's studying actuary. Super, oh. he's, he's smarter than me. Um, and, 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 and so you're trying to guide him to say, look, you, you need to find a way to, to sort of create something uh, more than just going to work for someone. It's very important to, 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 to work and, and get the experience. But ultimately, I think the agenda we need to push is for us to drive more entrepreneurship uh, in this continent. All right. So today and uh, since May of 2014, you've been Chief Executive Officer at Zenzel. Yes fitness group um, why fitness as a business so like I said before that I was always passionate about fitness and wellness um, and I think I saw a gap you know I saw a gap in the market um, not only as a black player but you know in South Africa speaking of the South African context you know fitness has always been seen as a nice to have you know um, only people with a specific uh, target market could access these beautiful facilities and so where I came in was, how can I bridge the gap uh, where it becomes accessible to a lot of people? And I think being in corporate, this is where most people spend their time at work. And so creating the convenience of setting up these world-class fitness centers that are one, accessible, they're affordable, um, in collaboration with the corporate uh, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a great idea. And, and so we scaled and you know, four and a half years later, we've got 13 facilities with some of South Africa's big companies, you know, from banks to mines, uh, you know, insurance companies, uh, breweries, etc. And so it is very exciting because it seems like there is an appetite for us to do that. Toomey once said he is building a business that is going to last for the next century with over a hundred health clubs planned in the next seven to 10 years. You mentioned in an interview that uh, you're planning for this business to outlive you um, and at least building it to last the next century. Yes. Um, what's your plan to make this business outlive you? <laughs> Putting a bit of pressure on me. Um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, going back to, to realizing that, you know, when I initially started this business, I think it was more, you know, I wanted freedom, financial freedom and just to do my own thing but you actually start realizing that there's a bigger cause. There's a story that Africans have to tell to inspire other Africans. And so to inspire other Africans is that one needs to create a sustainable business. Um, for me, it's not about a short term, make a quick buck and get out, but it's to say, how could I also be like other companies that have been around 30, 50, 100 years? And that is the legacy, uh, building to last. That's the legacy that I want to create, something that will be around even when I'm not around. All right, so your business currently attracts blue chip companies, but what was your initial strategy um, to attract and retain the, the corporates? There's two things. Um, I think forward thinking businesses are starting to understand the need to invest in its employees. Uh, lifestyle diseases are at its all time high. In fact, um, you know, employees' health uh, or, or the, the wellness or the productivity of, of, of your employees will become part of companies' KPIs where you know, if your workforce is not well or it, it's sick, uh, it actually has an effect on your bottom line. And so forward-thinking businesses are actually starting to understand that, that you have to invest in making sure that your guys are productive because that translates to you know, the bottom line and people being you know, less absenteeism. And so for me, uh, the mitigating factor was that I was able to create that. So it's not just about creating a gym space and people trying to have a six pack. And it's about creating holistic wellness. It's about data driven uh, sort of ecosystem where we produce uh, reports to the company, where we show them that 
you know, X amount of people who are not well because of being in a, you know, uh, exercise intervention program, they're actually getting better. And by getting better, they're living longer. And by living longer, the company is going to make more money and they're going to have more people working longer in their company. And, and if someone is healthy, uh, they're more happier, they're more engaged, and, and they, they're less sick. All right, so what are those hurdles and challenges that you've had to overcome um, to make the strides you've made so far? So I think uh, the first challenge is, you know, just looking back five years ago, it was that, you know, being young in the industry, not having the experience, knocking in corporate stores, you know, people were like, what do you know about yeah. this industry? You've never done it before. Why would we believe you? It was the hardest thing. I mean, the first 12 months, uh, we, we made no money. We literally were burning cash, um, knocking in doors, business development, um, you know, trying to acquire more business. And, and I think things started turning around. And, and one of the things that I've learned is, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they start business, they think in the first six months, they'll, they'll start making profit. <laughs> so that was quite a, a big lesson that I learned that you want, you know, it could probably take you two years to, to even start turning around. And, and, and so that was the first lesson is that, you know, one, you need to be patient. Uh, you need to keep refining, refining over and over and over. It's like a soccer player or a basketball player. You, know, you have to keep taking those shots mm. until eventually it just, it just goes in. And, and I had to refine that. And so it was a very challenge because, you know, you worry that you lose money and, and it, will, it will not work. But I think something just kept me motivated. The second one was capital raising. Um, I think it's a very capital intensive uh, sort of uh, sector. You know, you have to buy equipment. And so uh, convincing uh, you know, financiers to give you money was also a challenge, but I think eventually if you're able to prove the first, second, third concept, then it, it becomes a lot easier. Um, and, and um, you know, the, the third one is people. You know, you, you know employing 80 people <laughs> is, is not a joke. No. You, you know, it comes with <laughs> different dynamics, personalities, mm. and so entrepreneurs initially, when you build a business, you just think about growing the business, but then you realize when you grow the business, you're actually growing it with people. And so I had to step back to say, oh, you actually have to find a sort of a strategy and a vision of what culture do you want to create? What, what, what do you want your organization to be about? And so that's one of the challenges that I've had to have to say, I have people now that I have to manage. Um, and that was very difficult, you know. Um, people are, are complex, they have different personalities. And, and so, yeah, it's been quite a challenge. But I think I'll, I've overcome it and I'm still learning as, as I'm going. All right, so you were born in Soweto, right? Yes. Um, in Katlehong, actually. Ka okay. But I've lived in Soweto, I've lived in Tunisia. Ah, yes. Okay, beautiful. So My mom was going to say, that's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to quickly just check. I had to that, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, I mean, there's a young... Uh, man you know yeah. living in some township yeah. you know watching you is looking at you like wow he did it like i'm sure i could also do it yeah. if you were to try to chart a path or create some sort of strategy for him to step out from the township and become um the next to me um what would you advise him to do to have a big imagination i think for me you know, even the circumstances of being in a township um, and what, what the township represented, it was something that I, it was very difficult for me, you know, uh, especially in, in, in the apartheid times or post-apartheid, you know, being in a transition from leaving the townships to go to school in a, in a suburb with white kids. And, and, mm -hmm. and so you were almost living the best of both worlds. And for me, I really struggled to say, why do other people have better opportunities? They live in better houses, but I have to go back to, to something that's less. And so the only thing I had was an imagination to, to, to just start dreaming about. It starts with just dreaming. And, and I think that when, when people close themselves up to imagine and, and vivid colors and imagination, that's where it starts. And, and you need to start dreaming and imagining what you want to be. And, and the more you imagine, uh, and which is what I did, I, eventually it, it pushed me to say, well, now I have to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think imagination also comes with exposure, you know, reading books. Uh, you don't ha necessarily have to be in Santon to or be in New York. You know, now you've got the internet to read about information and read about things and, and really just let your mind explore about different opportunities around the world. Um, and, and I think that will take you somewhere. And, you know, guys now, they tend to be very close off and focus on, on different things. And, and if you can't imagine things, then you won't get anywhere. And I think the, for, for the kid out there, it's, it's just dream, read, uh, 
and explore yourself and, and let your imagination run wild and, and eventually you'll find something. All right. So, so what would you say makes the South African business landscape unique? Um, well, that's actually very, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think one of the things that <laughs> makes it unique is, you know, there's obviously also, uh, I mean, coming out of apartheid, uh, there's, there's also the broad-based economic and empowerment structure, which in a way is, is, is also supporting um, black businesses to, to enter into some of these industries that are uh, either monopolized or an entry, barrier to entry is, is almost impossible. And I think that's also one of the challenges that there's businesses that have been established for 100 years where if you come in as a young player, mm. you know, it's how do you even get there? Mm. And so what makes it unique is that the broad-based economic empowerment, um, although it still needs some refinement, mm -hmm. but it, it has played a role in terms of, you, you know, you, you can access uh, uh, flexible uh, capital um, and also you can participate in some of these industries. I mean, the industry that I'm in, as an example, it, it's also, what, it, it was a white dominated industry. Mm -hmm. And so for me to come in as a black player, I had no cash, I had no funding, but I was able to get you know, angel investment to say, look, we think we can assist you to, to fund your business. And also you have big corporates like this that also say, we think we would like to support you. And so that made it unique that, you know, I was able to have those two sort of stakeholders to say we will support you to grow your business and i think that's that's that makes it a little bit unique to to some some places around the continent with corporate clients including discovery health alexander forbes hall at insurance rand refinery and the university of witwatersrand tumi maintains that senzele is one of the top three gene brands in the world from a quality point of view all right so earlier on um I met Danny, I believe he's your Chief Operations uh, Office, Officer. Yes, yes. Um, but tell me, what's the current business structure um, at your firm? So, um, I mean, like I said, we've got 13 facilities um, and, and um, each facility is, is, is a branch. Um, and out of the branch, you typically have, so the organogram on the branch, you typically have a club manager, you've got a sales consultant, you've got uh, fitness coaches, You've got the receptionists, biokineticists, you know, sometimes you get medical doctors. And so there's a whole team, but obviously the branch has to be supported by, by, by the senior, so the operation support, where there's, there's guys operationally who will support uh, the facilities from you know, finance to uh, HR, training, etc. And so my main sort of functionality is, I don't necessarily get involved in operation. Danny does, so he basically, you know, my, my, my goal is to, to focus on growing the business, uh, acquisition, capital raising, creating relationships, uh, and making sure that, you know, what is the future, like you said, in the next five, 10 years. And that is the vision that I do. And, and so, and then once I get the deal, you know, Danny operates, sets it up, and then obviously rolls it down to, to, to recruiting the manager and recruiting a team that will run the facility. Oh, amazing. So what would you say are the most critical lessons um, that you've learned in running a business, um, possibly to profitability? So I think the, the, the critical lesson is um, always find people that are smarter than you. Um, by being able to, and when I say smart, it's, it's people that have more experience, people that know more than you. I think if I was the smartest person, if I was always a guy that comes up with the ideas and the way forward, then why am I even paying them? And so I want to be in a room with people that actually say, this is what I think we should do. This is the next move. And, and I just listen and say, okay, great, I agree with that. And so that's very critical in scaling and growing your business quickly, quickly because you have people that, that understand the vision. Um, the second one is, um, um, you know, having a good idea is, is great. I think a lot of entrepreneurs um, get caught up in a business idea, but what's very critical is having the ability to execute the idea. Uh, that is what investors look for. And so if you're gonna sit with someone and actually say, listen, I want you to buy into my business, you need to focus on the execution plan to say, this is how this will be done. All right, so tell me, how has uh, travel and interacting with different cultures added value to your person and possibly your business? Oh, it's, I mean, I think for me personally, that is like the most important thing. Traveling has really opened doors uh, in collab collaborating and speaking to different people uh, and, and just understanding different ways of doing things and, and, 
Um, and so it's something that I, it's, it's a personal investment for me to, to really, you know, I want to travel uh, three, four, five countries a year uh, so that I could actually learn different cultures and different ideas. All right, so how would you describe your leadership style? Um, my leadership style is, wow, that's actually never, anyone asked me that question. My leadership style is more, um, I think that um, I'm, you know, I'm relaxed in, in my nature with, with, with people in terms of, you know, I like to be approachable. Um, so I, I don't create a wall where people can't, and, and I prefer an open sort of way of communication. And the reason why I'm saying that is that we're very much at a critical stage in, in the business because we're at a growth point. And so it's very important to get feedback from anyone within the organization. A person to be able to say, you know what, there's an issue here, it needs to be sorted, without feeling like you know, they're not able to, to speak to you. Uh, and so that's very important. I'm always mindful not to make people, you know, like the boss is walking in, you know, people don't want to talk to you and they feel intimidated. So I, I really have this open policy and I think that's important. Okay. So tell me about your flaws and failings as a leader. My flaws at times is, um, I think, um, to, you know, have the ability to manage a, a big work workforce and I think you know, when you're an entrepreneur, like I said, your mindset was, was just about to make money and grow this thing. And suddenly, the, the weakness that I identified was, was to, to basically say, well, I actually need to invest in people. I love people, I work well with people. And I thought that those things would just come naturally. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, sometimes you have to put structure. You have to make deliverables and eco, uh, you know, set up an ecosystem for the things to work properly. All right, so very quickly, tell me what values are important to you and to your firm? Honesty and, and integrity is important because honesty translates to um, reputation. Reputation is a huge thing. And when I spoke about honesty and reputation, it's not just about how you carry yourself in your business, but how you carry yourself outside. And you know, besides the whole business, modeling the money, at the end of the day, it's about two human beings and they're sitting next to each other and say, can I do business with this man? Amazing. So what would you say is the biggest letdown you've experienced in business so far? Oh, too many. <laughs> but I'll just mention one. <laughs> um, I think the biggest letdown is that sometimes the, the people that you, you, you think you should work with or you have a vision, it, it does not necessarily translate to the same vision. So you may be with someone and you're sharing your vision and you guys look like you are on the same path. So you really, really, really need to re define and really understand that are we really on the same page? And, and that's how a lot of partnership, you know, sometimes they fail because of that, is that uh, people are not aligned. And so that was, the, the, you know, one of the biggest letdown where you realize that I don't share the same values as you. And, and, and for me, I, I'm not doing business because of just money. Uh, I'm doing business because I'm trying to create something uh, that will inspire people. And if, if it was just about money, maybe I would be working with, with specific in, you know, people, but it, for me, it's not just about money. From seeing travel as a personal investment in himself, to being dogged in his ability to skill to 13 outlets and 80 employees, Tumi must need his time to himself like most CEOs do. However, I'm keen to know, what does he do with his time? So I have a few quick fire questions for you. What do you love to eat? I love a good, American cheeseburger with fries. All right, how would you describe your fashion style? Depends on the occasion, and I think over the years I, I was able to sort of have a fashion style that kind of fits different occasions. All right, so um, what are your favorite fashion brands? To be honest, when it comes to clothes, I think my philosophy is if you look after your body, you can wear anything. Okay, <laughs> so what CEOs do you look up to? I think one of the, the big CEOs that I look up to is uh, the CEO of Discovery Health, uh, Adrian Gore. Uh, I mean, I love what he's done with, with the, the, the industry, the, you know, the medical uh, insurance industry in South Africa, in the rest of the continent, and, and I mean, then international business. Mm -hmm. And the innovation, and the, you know, he, he started as, a, as, as an actuary, he had an idea, he got investors, and uh, you know, this is a, you know, years later, they're a multi-billion business, and, and, and I love what they've done, and, and they thrive on innovation and, 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 and and ideas and always, you know, changing the status quo. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I love that about him. Um, uh, Richard Branson and what he's done with the, you know, the Virgin Group, 
um, also look up to him and, uh, and, and you know Barack Obama uh, although he's, he's not a businessman but I just his leadership style and you know coming out of whatever situation and and, and, and I think that yeah he you know meeting him he was he was a great inspiration mm. so, yeah. okay so what's your favorite car to drive Maserati okay so what's your favorite travel destination I went to Vancouver uh, a few months ago Canada mm -hmm. it is a beautiful country um, it's super clean you know and I really fell in love with it uh, and I would say you know out of you know traveling uh, Vancouver is, is, is probably amongst my favorite okay. because it's just an amazing and it's a beautiful place to be in so what's your favorite book of all time my favorite book of all time is Built to Last and uh, Built to Last is about how do you create businesses that are sustainable and that mm -hmm. will last forever. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that was my, my inspiration about building something to last. All right, so what book are you reading right now? Outliers by Michael Gladwell. Yeah. All right, so lastly I'd like to know, to me, what makes you happy? What makes me happy is to see people happy. I think, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a family oriented person. I'm a spiritual person. And I think for me, my happiness is, is being able to inspire people and seeing people change their lives because of what I was able to, how I lived by it, etc. And I think that really gets me excited. And so this mentorship and inspiring some, someone else to say, you know what, you could do this, you know, mm -hmm. I, you don't have to be the smartest person in the world. Uh, and when you see someone changing their lives and coming out of that, that, that really makes me happy. And it's something that I'm, I'm really gonna sort of spend a lot of time start doing. Um, you know, I'm working on writing a book, doing more speaking so that I can you know touch and be engaging with more people about that you know it's, it's, it's all possible and I think that's probably the one time I walk out and I feel really happy <laughs> thank you for coming on under 40 CEOs thank you sir really much appreciated right hi my name is Dumi Pake and you too can be an under 40 CEO